there is an addition on the agenda, uh, North Parkade repairs update and report recommendation. Um, you'll find it down further as uh, item 10.8 in the agenda. And uh, are there any announcements from council before we get started? Any upcoming events? Uh, Councilor Grace, did you want to speak about the, the hockey equipment exchange maybe? Well, that's... Well, the hockey equipment exchange is this Monday, so it's going to miss the television. But certainly what the United Way is doing is we're collecting used hockey equipment. We're vetting that hockey equipment and uh, making it available <coughs> to anybody that needs it at the LCLC next Monday during the Social and Minor Hockey League Association <laughs> registrations. Right. So it should save some families uh, some money, and it's open to everybody. So from whoever, whoever needs hockey equipment, uh, it's open for everybody. Excellent. Um, Anything else from Council? I'm, I'm going back a little bit, but uh, I just wanted to mention that on July 28th, we uh, had the Skate of the Art auction at the LCLC. We had 30 blank skateboard decks donated by Steve Hare and his family. And uh, we put them in the hands of some local artists and they transformed them into beautiful pieces of art that we auctioned off, bringing in $5,215, which Scotiabank has generously matched up to $5,000. <coughs> so we brought in, in, in a couple of hours, brought in over $10,000 for the skate park, right. which I think is going to make John's day. <laughs> <laughs> but I thank everyone for your support for coming out. It was a great event, uh, really well attended, and we really appreciate the support that we saw in, in, in that event. And now on our agenda tonight is the approval of the concrete tender. Did you have an item as well? Uh, just one. Uh, this coming weekend is the Summer Swimming Provincials for Nova Scotia in Windsor, Nova Scotia. So we certainly wish our uh, Bridgewater Barracudas all the best as they compete and try and bring back uh, the crown again. So. Excellent. Anything else? Uh, can I have a motion to approve the agenda, please? Councilor Fraschier, so seconded. Moved. Deputy Mayor Tanner, any discussion? All those in favor? Agenda is approved. Uh, the gallery is full, not because everyone is excited to hear council, although you're more than welcome to stay throughout the uh, four pages of our agenda. Um, but we do have some uh, exciting business to deal with first, and that is a youth travel grant and some achievement awards. And Deputy Mayor Tanner um, is going to call uh, the people down, and as you hear your name, if you can come forward and we'll make the presentation, and um, someone on staff will get a photo, I'm hoping. Um, yeah, so Deputy Mayor Tanner. Travel grant first, I see. Yes, please. Yeah, okay. Evan O'Toole is here. I saw him walk in. <coughs> Evan, come on down. Evan represented Nova Scotia at the 2017 Canada Summer Games, taking place in Winnipeg, Manitoba, July 28th to August 5th, 2017. He'll be, he has played outfield and pitched for the baseball team, and the players are ages 15 to 17 years old. Evan uh, played third center field and was a pitcher for Team Nova Scotia. He also has been selected to attend the Toronto Blue Jays Baseball Academy T12 Scouting Tournament as part of the Atlantic team. This tournament will take place September 14 to 17 at the Rogers Centre in Toronto. Evan is being recognized as a top 10 Atlantic Canadian selection. And Evan will also be attending the Vauxhall Baseball Academy in Alberta this com upcoming school year. So congratulations, Evan. Yeah. Uh, Jade Lee, let's see, oh, there she is. Jade uh, Lee won the Federation of Music Festivals Junior Piano Award at the annual festival, which took place in Liverpool in June. She was awarded the Maureen Hopkins Memorial, Memorial Rose Bowl for pian Junior Piano. This was Jade's fourth appearance at the Provincial Festival and the second year in a row winning the Junior Piano Award. Thank you. <laughs> Michaela, Michaela sitting in the back. Michaela Sabian and her partner Victoria Haworth represented Nova Scotia in beach volleyball at the 2017 Canada Summer Games. They took place July 30th to August 4th in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Michaela also completed in her second year of volleyball for the Katie University Axe Women during the 2016-17 season. Congratulations. Catherine Talbot. There, I saw Catherine sneak in. Catherine Talbot was the NSSAF Provincial Badminton Junior Girls Individual Champions for the second consecutive year. She also won gold in the 2017 Badminton Nova <coughs> Scotia Provincial Junior Under 15 Girls Doubles. Because of Catherine's success last year, she opted to play up in age category in both events at Provincials, winning a silver and under 17 singles. singles. Catherine was a member of Badminton Nova Scotia Provincial High Performance Team for the third year. 
and she represented Nova Scotia at numerous Atlantic Series events where she picked up gold at many of the competitions. Congratulations. Yeah. And the Bridgewater Bulldogs baseball team, I saw most of them stroll, stroll in here. Come on down, everybody. Uh, the Bridgewater Bulldogs posted a 5-1 record to win the Provincial 13 and Under Pee Wee A Baseball Championship banner last Labor Day weekend. Five teams competed in the round robin tournament that was held at the Kinsman Field in Bridgewater. The plaque inscription, 2016 Baseball Nova Scotia 13 Under Pee Wee A Provincial Champions with Spencer Fancy, Brandon Wenzel, Jalen Zink, Michael Vandertorn, Jack Laws, Aaron Lane, Tristan Eisner, Ben Guthrow, Easton Haley, Brett Risser, Owen Parsons, Patrick Randall, Julius Cohen, Coach Christopher Zink, Assistant Coaches Stephen Risser, Jamie Randall, Julio Fernandez, Zach Zink, and Manager Kelly Wenzel. All right. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, and they're hosting Provincials this year as well, so hope for a repeat. Mm -hmm. and congratulations to everybody. You are the first recipients of the new medals. Um, with the new town logo, so um, it's kind of exciting when we when I first saw them. Um, they're really really sharp looking. So, congratulations to everybody. Our next item is the minutes from June 26th and July 10th, 2017 council meetings. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes as circulated? So moved. Uh, seconder. Councilor Graves. Any discussion? Hearing none. Uh, all those in favor? Is carried. Okay, planning items. Item 7.1, policy 18, development agreements, proposed amendments. So some wording changes. And, uh, yeah, um, I don't have staff. any slides in relation to that proposal. Um, we're just trying to give a little bit more flexibility in the motion that council provides um, for development agreements. Um, right now, it's, we're required to give one year before the CAO and mayor have to sign the agreement before it has to go back through the whole process. We'd like to shorten that up or provide the option of shorten that, shortening that up in some situations because if we allow a year before signatures and then development permits are issued for one additional year, so now we're two years from the motion of council, and then the development permit is valid for another year, it could be three years before we know if there's going to be any activity on the development agreement, and it, that makes it challenging to provide um, advice and analysis for any other development proposals that are happening in the immediate area. So if you've got you know, a, a Southridge court development proposed, and you don't know if it's going to be built for three years, but then somebody's coming along and saying they also want to build another large apartment building on the, on the lot next door. You know, whether you can improve that is yeah. dependent on whether the previous application is being acted upon. So um, the proposal is simply to allow some flexibility with respect to that time frame. In some cases, a year will still be appropriate. In some cases, we'd like to shorten it up. Um, and also, there's required language in the development agreement policy um, that's required to be um, included in every development agreement requiring the owner to certify that they don't have any mortgages on the property. So obviously, that's not appropriate if there is a mortgage on the property. And typically, we just omit that language if that's the case. But So it's just kind of cleaning that up to formally allow us to change that part of the development agreement. Seems like logical changes. Any questions from members of council? Hearing none, someone prepared to make a motion? Yeah, I would move the town council for the town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendations of staff and revise policy 18, development agreements as presented in document 17-129A for immediate implementation as policy for the town of Bridgewater. Thank you. Can I have a seconder, please? Councilor Thorman. <laughs> Can I get a headache shaking my head back and forth? <laughs> um, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Motion is carried. Uh, our next item is a public hearing. Uh, I'll call the public hearing to order. Uh, statutory statutory requirements, uh, requirement report has been received, and so we'll turn it over to staff for, uh, for their input. Okay, so this is final consideration of a proposed development agreement relating to 141 La Have Street, which is La Have Auto Clinic. It's zoned industrial, um, it, it's in the industrial zone. Auto repair services are not currently a permitted use in the industrial zone, so it's a non-conforming use. Non-conforming uses can continue to exist, but there's limits on how they can expand. Um, and this applicant has come forward asking for permission to expand. The property is also located in the La Haye River Development Agreement area, which is all this hatched area on the zoning map, which provides another set of criteria 
uh, through which staff need to evaluate the proposed development agreement. So this is the subject property here, and this is La Have Street. Um, the, <coughs> the proposed location of the addition is on the north side of the existing structure, and it's going to provide two additional service bays. So the existing facilities is, is 1,200 square feet, and it's going to be um, almost that same size again, added to the north end of the building. So what we've done in the development agreement, we haven't provided a site plan. Um, instead, we're taking what we're calling a building envelope approach. So we're defining setbacks from the property line and from the public sidewalk and allowing the developer any future additions or changes that they would like to make within that building envelope. So the intention there is that they don't have to come back and keep asking council to um, amend the development agreement anytime they want to make a small change. So because the property is located in the Hay River Development Agreement area, there are other criteria. There are 13 criteria in the MPS, 11 of them don't apply. So those criteria would apply to properties in a flood zone, for example, or that are adjacent to the river, or that provide visual or physical access to the river, and none of those apply to this property. There are two criteria that apply to this property, one relating to um, access and access for emergency vehicles, and the other relating to a landscaping plan and the requirement to provide a landscaping plan and both of those two requirements are integrated into the development agreement. So the, uh, the development agreement is pretty straightforward. Uh, a few key points, uh, there can be no net increase in peak stormwater flow, um, requiring separation of new and existing <coughs> storm drainage from the sanitary sewer. Um, the, the vegetative buffer that's currently in place needs to be maintained where possible. The development officer has the option of requiring a landscaping plan. Um, we're not asking one for one for this development because we're satisfied with what it looks like, but because we're not asking for a development agreement um, the next time if they want to expand, the development officer has that ability to trigger a landscaping plan. And we're asking for some delineation between the parking facilities and the public sidewalk with movable um, landscaping islands or strips. And we're asking for them to close one of the points of access and there'll be two points of access remaining. So this is the last public part of the application process. Um, if council provides final consideration this evening, then we'll go into an appeal period and then register the development agreement, at which point um, it can be effective and they can go ahead with their addition. Great, thank you. Any questions from council on this? We've, we've kind of been through this, so I think we, we asked a lot of questions last time, which staff have answered. I would note that the applicant is here, so if you have any questions for them as well, then they've indicated that they're Yeah, and I spoke to the applicant who doesn't wish at this time to, to, to speak, so that's, and that's remains true still. You can speak oh, if you'd yeah. like. Yeah. It's fine. Okay, thank you. Are there any uh, comments from members of the public uh, on this proposal? No, hearing none. Um, oh, let's look at that. Following my rules here, it says closing remarks by the chairman. So that's me. I just, when when a business expands in town, it's a good news story. So you know, I'd like to congratulate the the applicant on obviously a growing business, and that's what we want for all our businesses in town. So congratulations on that. Um, is someone on council prepared to make a motion? I will. Your motion. Okay. I would move that the uh, council for the town of Bridgewater enter into a development agreement regarding the property located at 141 La Have Street in a manner similar to the draft development agreement dated August 14, 2017, and that the mayor and chief administrating officer are hereby authorized to execute this agreement only within the time frame described in the development agreement. Should the document not be signed within the time frame described in the development agreement, the council shall consider any request to sign the development agreement as a new application and follow the entire process required by the Municipal Government Act. I have a seconder, please. Councillor Graves. Any further discussion? Question. Questions being called. All those in favor? Motion is carried. And I would adjourn this public hearing. Congratulations. Our next item is uh, 7.3, application for map amendments rezoning from downtown residential R4 to neighborhood commercial C7 at 58 York Street. Yes, so this is an application in relation to uh, 58 York Street, which is here. Um, it's been used as a medical, uh, sorry, as a doctor's office uh, since the 1980s, really. 
It's located in a low and medium density residential neighborhood with some existing mixed use. It's also close to two existing commercial areas on York, Phoenix, and Dufferin streets, and close to institutional uses such as the Bridgewater Elementary School, the Bridgewater Junior Senior High, and the Bridgewater Fire Hall. The existing use was permitted by a development agreement that was entered into in 1980. Um, Dr. Barris has attempted to sell the property. It's been on the market for over a year. Um, he hasn't had any interest from any medical practitioners who would like to move in and continue the existing use. Um, so realistically, we're looking at a change of use. Um, it's not suitable for a residential use without extensive renovations. It's very much set up as a doctor's office, even though the exterior was designed to look like a residence. The proposed new use is the relocation of, his, of an existing hairdressing and aesthetics business, so it's a personal service shop under the land use bylaw. So under the current zoning, um, it's downtown residential as are all of the neighboring properties. Permitted as of right are one and two unit dwellings and some commercial office and institutional uses and also multi-unit residential uses are permitted by development agreement only. There's no development permitted by site plan approval under the current zoning. Uh, personal service shops would only be permitted as a home-based business, so that would require the owner to actually live in the, in the dwelling. The requested zoning is the neighborhood com commercial zone. Uh, permitted as of right are also one and two unit residential uh, dwellings. Um, sm some small scale commercial and office uses are permitted by site plan approval. In some cases, uh, there's development permitted by development agreement, but that's not permitted in this case, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, the C7 zone is intended to allow neighborhood scale commercial uses mixed into residential neighborhoods. So in this case, rezoning would not permit any development by development agreement. So just to compare the two zones, um, on the left is the existing zone, uh, downtown commercial. On the right is neighborhood commercial. So permitted as of right in both zones, one and two unit dwellings. By development agreement only in the existing zone, we have grocery and convenience stores. Those will be permitted by site plan approval in the new zoning. There are also a number of other uses, restaurants within grocery stores and convenience stores, multi-unit residential up to 37 units per acre inns and older buildings, and any development permitted in the institutional zone, all of those are permitted currently by development agreement in the existing zoning. In the new zoning, um, by site plan approval, we'd have grocery and convenience stores, offices, and personal service shops only up to 200 square meters or 2,153 2, square feet. Uh, you could also have some a smaller multi-unit residential <coughs> up to four units only uh, with ground floor commercial in the proposed zoning. So there's no development permitted at all by development agreement um, in the proposed zoning and no development permitted by site plan approval in the existing zoning. So that's really one key difference. Currently, they would have to go through development agreement to have any commercial use. Under the proposed zoning, they could have some commercial uses by site plan approval. So when I say that development wouldn't be permitted by development agreement, I, I don't mean that it would never be permitted by development agreement in that zone. It's just on that property because um, under CDA pol policy CDA 3 sub C, um, the development can only be permitted by development agreement on corner lots, and this isn't a corner lot. So just a refresher about the difference between a site plan approval process and a development agreement process. Um, the site plan appro approval process is supposed to be kind of a hybrid approach between simply allowing something as of right and requiring a development agreement. So it allows the development officer to have some control over some details of um, the site plan. So for example, vegetation and, le and landscaping, storage facilities, lighting, pedestrian access, and signage can all be controlled by the development officer. But it doesn't require a public process. So the development officer will inform property owners within 30 meters of the proposed development, but they don't get an opportunity to comment. It's simply a, a, an information uh, mill out that the DO does and there's no further involvement from council. So with respect to the public participation meeting, it was held on July 26th, and it was attended by five neighbors of the proposed, um, of, the, of the subject property, and the applicant and planning staff. There were significant concerns brought forward um, that once the property is rezoned, it could be open to a number of different kinds of development. It wasn't specifically the hairdressing use that was the subject of the concern, but particularly um, the potential that there could be a restaurant in the, the subject property or um, a larger, more intensive use that would be permitted by the zoning but wouldn't necessarily have the same effect on the neighborhood. So 
one staff explained that those the uses were actually all permitted now by development agreement and you could actually have quite a bit more intense use under the current zoning than would be permitted by site plan approval under the proposed zoning. There was a little bit of understanding that that, um, you know, that might be okay, but there is still, I would, I would say, some pretty significant concerns by the neighbors in this, uh, in this neighborhood. So with respect to the planning analysis, um, council can only consider amendments that are consistent with the intent of the municipal planning strategy. So we need to kind of look at the development in terms of, um, because it is a mixed use proposal, does the MPS kind of support mixed use? And there is some support for mixed use in the municipal planning strategy. So if we look to objective three of the MPS, um, it says that council's objective is to mix compatible land uses to promote diverse and convenient neighborhoods. Um, the focus is more on mixing residential uses into commercial neighborhoods as opposed to mixing commercial uses into residential neighborhoods. So that comes out in um, the commercial designation description in the municipal planning strategy, specifically policy C3. Um, and really council's intention needs to be to minimize land use conflicts. So we need to think about if the proposed use is going to have a different impact on the community and on the neighborhood than the existing use. So I would point out that the downtown residential zone, so that's the current zone, is intended to be a mixed use zone because of all those commercial uses that are permitted by development agreement. And the commercial residential zone and the medium density residential zone are also mixed, mixed use zones. So there is some support that way in the MPS for this idea that mixed use can be good and can be a good thing for a community. Mixed use supports walkability by mixing everyday destinations into neighborhoods. And Staff consider that the impact on the neighborhood, considering noise, traffic, signage, and parking, would be similar um, for the proposed use than for existing uses that would be permitted by development agreement. And I think it's important for council to keep in mind that this is an adaptive reuse of an existing structure. It's been vacant for a year. Dr. Barris has been trying to sell it for a year and hasn't had anybody who's interested in using, using it for a medical practice. The property has a history of non-residential use, and it's not suitable for residential use without significant reno res sorry, renovations. So one thing that we did consider is parking. Um, for a personal service shop, they would require one vehicle space for every 30 square meters of gross floor area. So that would require seven spaces, but there are um, existing parking facilities that would satisfy that requirement. There would also be a requirement for bicycle parking. They would be required to provide two bicycle parking spaces, but that's not a significant concern. We're confident that the uh, conditional purchaser will be able to provide that. So there was a mistake on the appendix to the report. This was listed as neighborhood commercial. So the, the correct name for the designation is limited commercial. And we'd like to redesignate the property for limited commercial and rezone the property for neighborhood commercial. So just to recap of where we are in the process. This is the wrong arrows. We're actually here um, at the planning analysis report to council. Um, the next step, if council provides first reading this evening, would be a public hearing which we're asking to be scheduled for September 11th. So that's all I have. Yeah. Thank you. Questions of staff? Again, we've had this item before. Councillor Graves. I guess I just one. We've always been um, told that it's a personal service shop hairdresser. But on the 30th of July, Mr. Bars, or Dr. Bars, excuse me, sent a letter saying a prospective buyer for my property plans to have a hair salon and perhaps some residential or office space. So does that mean that it's changed or? Um, not to my knowledge. I have spoken with the conditional purchaser and he's very much intent on having a, a personal service shop and he's not intending to use the whole property, the whole structure for a personal service shop. So just to back up a little bit, the property is just a little bit over that threshold that would trigger a development agreement. So 2,100 square feet, if the use is over 2,100 square feet, they, it could only be permitted by development agreement, but he's not planning on using the whole space, mm -hmm. so that's why he can fit into the site like, plan approval process. Mm -hmm. But he didn't indicate to me that he was intending to use the remainder of the space for an office or for residential, except perhaps an office you know, to support the primary use, but he could. Okay. Um, if it's rezoned, then anything permitted by the, by the land use bylaw will be permitted. Further questions? Someone prepared to make a motion? Yes, Your Worship. I move the Town Council of the Town of Bridgewater 
endorse the intended changes to the draft amended future land use map in the municipal planning strategy appendix 6 of document 17-102a to redesignate the subject property to limited commercial and the draft amended zoning map of the land use bylaw appendix 6 appendix, appendix 6 of document 17-102a to rezone the subject property to neighborhood commercial c7 and proceed proceed to a public hearing and second reading at a council meeting to be held on monday september 11 2017 and authorize staff to publish all public notices pursuant to section 168 of the municipal government act thank you can I have a seconder please Councilor Frazier, further discussion? Hearing none. Question. Questions being called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item is non substantive development agreement amendment uh, for 312 Dufferin Street, which is old, formerly known as the Old Town Golf Course. Oh, in my head, I always, I guess because of the new road, I always think High Street, but of course it was on, the entrance was on. No, but yeah. now it's on <laughs> High Street. So yeah. um, just for that clarification for the public, we're talking about uh, the old Old Town Golf Course. The old Old Town Golf Course, which also this development was briefly called Eagle Ridge for a mm. period of time. So when it was before Council last, it was known as Eagle, Eagle Ridge Estates, I believe. So just quickly, it is the site of the former Old Town Golf Course. Uh, the property itself spans the boundary between the town and the district of Lunenburg. So there are 16 acres within the town boundaries. The original development agreement uh, came forward in 2012. There was an amendment to that development in uh, 2014. There was a change in property owner in 2015. And now this application to amend, uh, here we are in, in 2017. So in order to have a non-substantive amendment to a development agreement, uh, we have to ensure that it's not listed as one of the substantive matters. So in the existing development agreement from 2012, uh, section 19 says that all matters identified in subclause 19B are non-substantial. Um, oh, are, yeah, all matters not identified, it's one of those double negatives, not identified in this clause are non-substantial, which may be changed or altered without a public hearing, but by resolution of council. So those matters that are substantial are anything, uh, are these matters right here. So beyond a maximum of 157 dwelling units, any changes to the minimum front yard setbacks, side yard setbacks, lot areas or lot frontages, and the addition or deletion of land. So there are a number of changes proposed within this non-substantive amendment, but they are not uh, any one of those items identified as substantive. Can I just ask a question sense? before you move on? So it's substantive if they want to go to 158 dwellings. Correct. But we put a lot of money into infrastructure improvements. Mm -hmm. So if they said, oh, we're going to put up one dwelling, that would be a non-substantive change from so the the original the original development agreement was for 157 dwelling units the amendment in 2014 dropped the number of units down yeah. to 118 this proposal is bringing it back to 148 so all original negotiations between the town and this applicant or this development rather were based on 157 dwelling units. And yes, beyond, if they were to add one more to bump it up to 158, then yes, that would trigger that would trigger a, a substantive amendment process, which is the same as entering into a brand new development agreement. It would have a public hearing component to That's it. I'm going with this though, right? Like if, if they decided, listen, we're, I'm just gonna build a house for myself, and we've built a pumping station, <laughs> thinking there's gonna be a development, yeah. and there's gonna be tax revenue from those residents. I would, I would hope that just in going forward, we kind of, maybe have a minimum and a maximum for a large development? That would be good future just, discussion. Yeah. So just quickly, the context, um, I think I've been through most of this, uh, but in terms of where it is, so there's Duff Dufferin Street, H High Street, out to Hebville. Um, so you have the NSCC next door, you have the commercial Gateway Plaza, and you have low density development over here. So it's a, a very mixed, neighborhood uh, and just quickly we have the the zoning map the current zoning right here and the uh, 
future land use designation map right there, they, they pretty much mimic each other with the existing zoning that's in place and then what's thought, contemplated for the future. So again, a mix of commercial, uh, general commercial, low density, um, this comprehensive residential development as well. There are seven amendments um, to the development agreement and I'm gonna just briefly, because it's been a long time since this has been before council, I will briefly walk you through uh, each of the seven. So there are changes to part one of the development agreement. Part one is the use section. So this includes replacement of schedules B1 and B2, which are the revised layout and the revised phasing plan. There's an increase in density from the amended development agreement from 7.25 units per acre to 9.25 units per acre. Comprehensive residential development, uh, comprehensive residential zone allows 25 units per acre, so it's still well under the overall density. Uh, the big changes to the uh, amended agreement is the addition of a 36 unit building on Street A um, and slight changes to the number of the different types of housing proposed. Um, but the big change is due to the grade of the property, they, they couldn't figure out how to do single or, or semi-detached dwellings there uh, and it was better suited to a larger uh, multi-unit building. So they're proposing a 36 unit building here, which is why you see such a larger jump in the proposed density from the amended development agreement. Um, so this is phase 1B and phase 1A. Um, and as you know from being up in that area, they've started building these roads already because the road placement has not changed. So the existing development agreement in place allows them to start building the road. This is all about the configuration of the lots. So this is the revised phasing plan. So again, phase one is wholly within the town. Phases two and three are outside in the municipality. And there is a, um, a memorandum of understanding between the town, the District of Lunenburg, the Public Service Commission, and the developer that was signed in 2014 regarding service provision. Um, so that can be recirculated to council and perhaps should have been attached to this. I apologize for that omission. Um, but uh, we can recirculate that memorandum of understanding so you can have a, a refresher as to what has been agreed to in terms of services as they move forward to phases two and three. Very editorial for the change to part five. It was a small wording change around um, the submission of detailed engineering drawings for each public street, so as the streets are being developed. Uh, part seven was the uh, removal for the shared bicycle lane signage and marking on the street as it was deemed unnecessary because we have new design and construction standards that were adopted after the initial plans for this. So as a local street, uh, local residential streets are to be designed for comfortable and safe pedestrian and bicycle movements. Uh, it will be a public street, however, so we can always add that in at a later date if it's deemed not to be comfortable and signage is required. Um, but that was just sort of a we didn't think because our standards are now different and require that, it seemed a little bit redundant. Changes to part eight is simply around the new schedule D1 showing uh, the, the landscaping requirements and the location of street trees, uh, but also allowing for a variance of street tree planting subject to approval of uh, the town engineer if it's found to be. There's a lot of services under the street, so if there's not quite enough space, then perhaps finding a different location other than what's cited on schedule D1. Also, just an editorial change identifying because the lots are now renumbered in this new site plan. So this is the revised landscaping plan showing locations of trees. Uh, the change number five is around changes to the public open space. So the public proposed public open space is also part of the stormwater management system. So there'll be an engineered wetland uh, that will also be part of the uh, the main feature of the uh, public open space with walking trails and other amenities. Uh, so the development agreement is requiring a park plan for that space and a memorandum of understanding to clarify roles, responsibilities, and financial commitments for carrying out that new public open space. Um, and so rather than put it all into the development agreement, we've committed to doing a memorandum which allows it to happen at a different time frame. The plan has already been presented to the Parks, Recreation and Culture Committee. They've provided comment as has the Director of Recreation, Parks, Recreation and Culture and the, um, and the town engineer around this. Uh, so there are some financial commitments that the property developer will be doing 
as well as uh, what we would be doing for the development of a public open space in a new area. So this that, is that accounts for water coming off the whole site. Phase yeah, two so and it's three. going to be managing. I have an image right here if you'd like to look, Michael, um, showing, and, and this is all with subject to the approval of the, the town engineer, the stormwater management system, but it will be collected into a, a, a series of ponds before the outlet uh, over here, so it allows for the, the sediment to fall out, for the plants to treat the water, and for it to then discharge. But that would so, only be for phase one, right, just based, based on the grading, to, to Councilor Gray's point, just because the whole the whole area that's in MODL, it, water will flow the other way. Yeah. Right? So they'll have to come up with their own. I think it all flows down, doesn't it? No, it cuts on the hill, right? Yeah. Phase it's one is yeah. down. on this side, and phase two is all okay. downhill, right? Yeah. yeah. So just to put this in context, uh, uh, High Street is right here, and, and Dominion Street. So this is that street that you're seeing being built. So it comes in behind these four semi-detached units. So you'd be able to do a nice little loop. Um, this also right, uh, right around here is town-owned land that's landlocked behind the Nova Scotia Community College. So there's opportunities to sort of unlock that town-owned parcel in behind uh, in terms of access. So I think it's right about there. Um, and then right here is actually the 36-unit um, 36 36 unit building that's being proposed. Just go. Sure. Where is the... <coughs> The brook that was there is a golf course bad on hole number eight at the bottom I'm of that hill. I'm going to defer to Larry for that. Is that uh, part of that on that left is next to the community college, Larry? Yeah, it, it ultimately, um, it, it, there was a, a low point that went down through that yes. area that will be concentrated into the, the wetland and then discharged back to the original water course ditch yeah. in behind the community college. Yeah. The reason I bring that up because when you flush that tank out before, that all went down into that and then down. Correct. There's still the that that particular the discharge will go to the storm sewer system within right. the street. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I hit a few golf balls in that ditch. That's why I know. <laughs> you want those back, don't you? <laughs> so, so the six goes into the it goes into the system. Sorry. Sorry, Alan. So your question is: it goes into the system and then goes through the through the pond? wastewater treatment plant, right? That's the, the system. The, which the the original ditch <coughs> through through the, the, you mean the, the golf water? course or the stormwater? The, yeah, stormwater goes through the three ponds now, right? A portion, a portion in phase one, a portion of the stormwater um, up to um, approximately where it says Street B uh, will go down the street and through the Dominion Street system. Mm -hmm. uh, the other portion that's captured above or or to the bottom of um, of the uh, diagram uh, will go through the wetland and then discharge to the um, ditch in behind the community college. So we haven't made any changes to the existing development agreement around stormwater management. Okay. Those all still stand and they're all subject to the approval of, of Larry here. Uh, change number six is changes to building characteristics. So this is the removal of Schedule C from the existing development agreement, which were the building elevation drawings. It's my understanding that the previous developer of this uh, land had proposed to do the development themselves, had a whole bunch of, of building elevation drawings. This developer is, is proposing to subdivide and sell the land off individually, so it's not going to have a uniform look and feel to the subdivision. So that's the removal of the building elevation drawings. So all buildings within the development are subject to the land use bylaw and the zone requirements of comprehensive residential. Uh, the maximum height is also set within this section for the 36 unit building, and that's to be four stories, which is slightly beyond, uh, so one story beyond the, the maximum allowed in the zone standards. So that's also, it'll be, it has to account for, so that'll be three levels of, of uh, living space and one uh, underground parking. And it's also accommodating the, um, the, the pretty intense slope of that uh, particular site. The final change proposed tonight is changes to the signage provisions. So that's the addition of a permission to install a subdivision sign saying Old Town Hills. And, uh, and it's really trying to um, uh, pay homage, I guess, to the former use of the site. And so those are actually all golf clubs. It's stainless mm -hmm. brushed steel. It's quite lovely uh, what he's proposing with golf clubs, and it'll say Old Town Hills. Uh, and that will be um, 
the location is subject to the approval of the development officer, but there's many other subdivisions around town that have name signs that identify where they are. So staff recommend council approve the proposed non-substantive amendments to the existing development agreement. If they're approved, there's notice of the approval published in the paper, a 14-day appeal period to the Utility and Review Board, and a 12-month period to execute the agreement. Any further questions? Thank you. Questions of staff? Councilor Thorburn. Yeah. Does, I guess the plan department still picks the road names for that subdivision? Uh, how is that determined of what the street names are? Now? Right. The, um, there is a, a, we list. Have a There's list. a process yeah. and a list. He doesn't, yeah. he gets, the, the developer has some, a list that we've provided him with uh, options yeah. um, and things like that. But ultimately, I do believe it is up to yeah. the yeah. developer. Okay. But it'll come back, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Tanner. Jessica, two for you. Um, phase 1A and 1B, is, is that the developer building those? Or is, is he or she still, or they still, Subdividing, subdividing and, selling, and, and selling. So, so he's indicated he has uh, potential purchasers, so someone who would like to uh, develop different elements of what's proposed in phase one and A, one B. Sorry, I'll just uh, quickly zip back to so, those. So, um, so all those, they can't build beyond, like this is, this is set, right? So whoever's going to buy, this will be building a semi. Right. So he, right. They have they. someone that uh, is potentially interested in building a four-story apartment building. Uh, yes, there. Uh, okay. This is a three-story, 24 this, unit. Yeah. Yep, okay. they do. And you know, these are there's some gardens which are three units, townhouses which are four units, uh, okay. but mostly it's semi-detached with some single units as well. Yeah. And then, and have they given you any guidance on timeline for this? I mean, this seems to be a development that has extended a long period of time and. We all want to see it moving. There seemed to be some idle time over the last year, and no, That's and they don't have to. Well, um, there must be a, a limitation, I guess, at some point where this has to be. Re restarted. I mean, they're they're in the process of building the street now. I don't know if Larry wants to comment on the street building. The street building, because they need to subdivide in order to build. They have to build the street to public street standards, to our standards, yeah. before we will take them over, before they're conveyed to right. the town. And they, he can't subdivide, or the developer can't subdivide those properties off until the land, the street is public. Okay. Because our subdivision rules require that all land is, is subdivided off of public, has public street frontage. Okay. So okay. that will be um, a hang up. Okay. Certainly. It has been a very, from my understanding, trying to get up to speed and, and reading all the iterations of the development agreement and all the sure. different elements of it, it certainly has been a long time in the making. We get a number of questions asking about it. We pass them all directly on to the developer. Um, he's He seems quite committed, but if you wanted to speak about the road, Mary. Uh, well, there was a bit of a delay. There had to be some changes, um, I'll say, figured out because of the proposed new uh, buildings. Oh, okay. So they had to determine what um, services they required. Um, I did notice recently there is activity up there yeah. again, so yeah. okay. it seems like they're back on at, at construction. Okay. Now I was under the impression that the, the large buildings they are building. I'm and not going to speak on behalf of the developers. That, so. That's maybe. Do you recall that when we had our presentation at Parks and Rec that that's kind of what we were told that they're going to do the buildings and then try to sell the parcels for the houses. Yeah, no. That was the impression I got. Yeah. I, I don't know that that was ever promised in any document. No, but, but yeah. <laughs> if that, if hopefully that's the case, because that would be a I'd be happy to ask that question to Hassan to get clarification so. for you, Thank if you'd you. like. And question two, if you'll permit. Uh, so you talked about the, the design of the roadways with new levels of construction, or I can't remember how you phrased it, that allow it to be bicycle friendly and so on and so forth. So we, a few years ago, invested a fair amount of money in putting in Shero systems and painting lines mm -hmm. on roads and so on. So what you're saying is that doesn't apply anymore for this No, those Sheros, those are all on collector or arterial arterial streets. Okay. Uh, this is a local street. This road is a okay, local road. And so any local road should be comfortable for cycling on. Okay. Right? Gotcha. So yeah. it's like, you know, Queen Street is a local road. Okay. You should be okay to bike on that. Uh, I'll ask the obvious. I assume that our water reservoir, we have the proper protection in place for that. We have the easements and everything. Yes. Wonderful. Councilor Frazier. I just had a question with uh, 
standards for sidewalks. I, I'm assuming this would have sidewalks, or is that not a requirement? It has a sidewalk on one side of one the side. street. Okay. What does it show? Sorry. It's on this. You one? Yeah, Larry, it's, help I me out here. Gray, it's, it's on the, the, yeah, it's oh, on the, the south side. side. The south side, and that yeah. would go up. And with there. the proposed change in the engineered wetland combination parkland, they added a uh, sidewalk on the north side from the intersection back to uh, the one entrance. Okay, the Sorry, dark it's gray. hard to see from yeah. here. Yeah, mm -hmm. and there's crosswalks painted there as well. Mm -hmm. so. yep. Okay, thank you. Councilor Graves. So just, uh, I guess first, the missing document, this is in regards to the, to the, um, the, the agreements between the TOB, MODL, Public Service Commission, and specifically, I guess the, I guess the question is in regards to the properties in MODL and the amount, and all those properties will be draining in, or all the people will be entering or exiting, exiting the site via via the town of Bridgewater. So, which obviously puts excess pressure on. Yeah. So it it addresses many of those. There's there's a number of other number of documents that I uncovered that are related to this. So mm -hmm. we'll recirculate them to to council for that. Oh, okay, and just a couple of others. It says uh, in, in, in Appendix D, municipal structures being constructed to suit the proposed development. So, so is that the the, uh, the water plant or the pump station? So that's uh, Appendix D of the original development agreement. Is that the original? Probably. That's not Page. in the uh, amendment before you. It's not. Okay. Okay. Just one other thing, though, the future traffic lights at the corner of uh, High and, and the New Road, when, when is that going to? There was a <coughs> traffic impact analysis study that was done with the original mm -hmm. uh, proposal, and there was a recommendation, I think, based on the volume. I, I can't say for sure what that was, mm -hmm. but the developer has uh, responsibility to put those traffic lights in uh, when that, um, that uh, analysis recommended mm -hmm. for them to be put in. I can't recall what, when exactly that is, but as the development proceeds and becomes busier, mm -hmm. uh, there is a, a, a time at which um, that report recommended the installation of those lights. Okay. By the developer. Yeah. Any further questions? Is someone prepared to make a motion? Councilor Frazier. Yes, Your Worship, that Council of the Town of Bridgewater amend the existing development agreement regarding the property located at 312 Dufferin Street, property identification number 2003178 in a manner similar to the draft amendment to a development agreement dated July 28, 2016, and attached to document 17-130 as Appendix E. The Mayor and CEA. CAO are hereby authorized to execute this amendment to a development agreement only within the next 12 month period. Should the instrument not be signed within this 12 month period, Council shall consider any requests to sign the amendment to a development agreement as a new application and follow the entire process required by the Municipal Government Act. Thank you. Can I have a seconder, please? Council McDonald. Any further discussion? Question. Questions being called. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Our next item under correspondence for action, um, we have a request for a CAT bylaw that has come forward. And um, this is not a new topic. And uh, although we have one letter in our, in our package, uh, I do have to stress that this is not being triggered by one complaint. We get a number of, um, of calls and emails, all of us do throughout the year um, and so what is the wish of council with this well your worship I, I move the town council of town of Bridgewater refer the request from residents Adrian and Betty Martell for a cat bylaw to staff for report and recommendation is there a seconder Councillor Thorburn uh, discussion if I may yes. uh, the letter came to me and I circulated to council uh, I actually have a lot of sympathy for this request. Uh, anyone who has a garden in their backyard knows that, uh, me being no exception, my, my, my backyard garden is tended by six cats that I don't own. Uh, and, uh, you know, and it's a sensitive topic because you have uh, neighbors who have cats and neighbors who don't, and 
they don't want to complain about their neighbors and that type of thing. Uh, we have a dog <coughs> bylaw that works very well, and I know the city of Halifax does have a cat bylaw, and I think there's some others around that we could probably look at. Uh, I think it's time we looked at it in a serious manner. Anyone else wish to comment? Deputy Mayor Tanner. I would just suggest that when staff do look at this, they also look at it in combination with the uh, the rat issue we're facing right now. And I certainly know that Chicago brought in feral cats to resolve that problem relatively quickly. And uh, I know some cats in the neighborhood are certainly helping out the rat problem in our <laughs> area. So, uh, so yeah, I think just some consideration of that as well is it would be good. And yeah, we're going to be dealing with the <laughs> with the rat issue further on the agenda. Um, like I said, this is not a new issue. I think what this comes down to is it's respect for other people's property. So if you have a, a pet that's going on someone else's property and tearing up their garden or destroying their garden, it's, it's, it's a respect of property mm -hmm. issue. More in my opinion yeah. than it is a, you know, pick an animal, it's not that, right? That's my opinion. We have a mover and a seconder. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Motion is carried. Uh, Municipality District of Yarmouth, placement of a Doppler radar system, which is timely, as I just saw in the news today. There's a tropical storm working its way into a hurricane coming up towards off the shore of Nova Scotia. Um, someone want to make a motion? We'll have a discussion with that. Councilor Graves? I move the Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater refer the request from the Municipality of the District of Yarmouth regarding placement of a Doppler radar system to the Regional Emergency Measures Organization, REMO, for consideration. Seconder, Second. seconded by Councilor McGinnis. Any further discussion? Pretty straightforward, sending this to Remo. Uh, Councilor Graves. No, it's okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All those in favor? Motion is carried. Uh, building inspection report, June 2017, is included in your, uh, in your documents. And um, I like looking at the <laughs> building estimates year to date chart um, for 2017. That looks quite promising quite exciting uh, this is just for your information and for the public's information so if you have any questions or comments you can um, ask the town engineer now or you can send him a email or make an appointment to visit him he loves having visitors in his office Councilor <laughs> Thorburn and there at what point in time are those numbers put in the process is it when it starts? Is it before it starts? Is there, because we've got a lot of development that's going on that I'm not sure if those numbers are in there or not. Uh, once an application's received and paid, then it would enter the system. Whether it was worked on or not? Correct. Staring <laughs> <laughs> competition. Mm -hmm. So the one we just application up on top of the hill that those numbers are in there then um, in the old there's town? been there's been no built no applications applied for as they've yet so the no development there agreement's be. been signed but no building applications but no building permit Correct. No building. so the building permit triggers it yes yeah. be yes. in that okay that's fair any further questions no okay you need to, you know where to find mr Feener. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, our next item is uh, recommendation of the Development Officer Heritage Coordinator for the Heritage Advisory Committee revising the terms of service and um, it looks like the last time they were uh, they were updated by a motion of council back in 2011 and the last update was initiated um, by the 2008 review of the town committee and commission report. What is the uh, wish of council? Council I'll bring that forward, your worship. Uh, I would move that Town Council of the Town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendations of staff on behalf of the Heritage Advisory Committee and approve the revised Heritage Advisory Committee's terms of reference as contained in document 17 116. And a seconder, Councillor Fajir. Any discussion? Councillor Graves. I, I know, shouldn't there be a staff member as part of a committee like that? There is. So, there is. That, there is. so Nick, Nick, Nick is Nick. the development did I, officer. Did I miss it? I didn't notice staff member under membership. Yeah. Uh, Nick and I and Peter was on that committee. So Nick, as his role as the, the uh, development officer, is the heritage coordinator, right. I believe. So um, he wears both those hats. Sorry, one sec. Yeah, um, I just don't see it in there. 
to under 4B. Um, okay. Museum <laughs> Commission. Did, am I losing something or? Does it need to be? Sorry, just yes. It's okay. I don't. I don't believe he's a voting member. Therefore, as a staff resource, he attends all heritage advisory committee okay. meetings. Okay. I just didn't see it mentioned. I figured. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. We have a mover and a seconder. Any further discussion? Yes. I, I just yeah. bring it up. What we looked at when we was doing the terms of reference is trying to get them in line with other committees that the town had. And the reference that we was using, we had no vehicle to remove somebody from the committee. And, and then we looked at the, the years, how you service levels, in one year, two year, three year, and, and try and get all of them uh, the same. We looked at three or four different sets before we uh, added some stuff in here to, to make them concur with each other. So just a housekeeping issue would allow us to operate really okay thank you ready for the motion ready for the, the vote all those in favor motion is carried um as promised the next item is the recommendation from <laughs> the strategic initiatives coordinator for uh rat monitoring program and um <coughs> this is an issue that is plaguing i would say coast to coast most uh certainly urban centers and um, it's getting worse, not only here, but uh, Halifax has a, a similar issue. And so um, the recommendation is to do a monitoring program to kind of get our bearings and, and figure out what we need to do in terms of next steps. Someone prepared to make that motion? Councilor McDonald. I would move that Town Council of the Town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendation of staff and approve an unbudgeted expenditure of approximately $1,200 for a three-month monitoring program, assessment of rat population and public education to, through the bridge newsletter. Seconder, we're going to have discussion. Councilor Fragier, uh, discussion? Deputy Mayor Tanner. So I'm not sure who to address this to, but do I have this right that we're actually going to feed them? <laughs> and by how much they eat, we'll then decide how much of a rat population there is in the town of Bridgewater? That's, 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 the, that's, the, that's the plan. That's, it, yeah. it, I'm assuming that they they did staff did research on what is the best way to is it find a food out company that's selling this plan to us or no? there were a few people that met with a uh, provider um, and this was the recommendation apparently they uh, can by quantifying the amount um, that is eaten over a period of time they can then um, predict the population um, and uh, as far as um, th there's not a lot you can do to get rid of them um, without doing uh, this step first. You have to determine that there is in fact a problem before they uh, are able to legally um, implement a program. Okay. And there's probably the answer to the question. You have to do this before they can legally implement a program. Because the easy answer is we have a rat problem. Yeah. Correct. Right? Like, uh, they, they cannot implement a program without being able to quantify it. But it, it sorry, it, to me it seems a little bit unscientific in the sense that how do they determine where to put the bait stations? And by putting a bait station in a neighborhood that doesn't have rats currently, are you then creating a whole new problem where the rats are seeking out the food and going into that neighborhood? Does that? They, they would work with staff. It would be a combination of where in the town we've received uh, complaints. Right. Um, so, yeah, the program would be uh, developed with staff. I would suggest you ask yeah. the members of the Bridgewater Police Department because they know where they all are. Mm -hmm. Both kinds of rats, but just like the <laughs> rats, that <laughs> 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 they, they, they see them because they're out at night. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm, 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 I'm being genuine when I say I would, I would coordinate that with, with them because they, when they're out at night in their patrol cars, they see them. So. Maybe they can do the study. <laughs> um, Did we vote on that? No, we haven't voted yet. Questions have been called. All those in favor? 
Motion is carried. <laughs> There's a lot of animals roaming around Bridgewater, apparently. <laughs> Uh, recommendation to the Sustainability Planner for the 2018 Sustainable Community Award Program nomination for Energize Bridgewater. Councilor Graves. I move that Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater direct staff to apply to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to nominate the Bridgewater Community Energy Initiative, also known as Energize Bridgewater, for the 2018 Sustainability Community Award Program in the energy category and to submit a letter of support from Council towards that application. And a seconder, Deputy Mayor Tanner, just close <laughs> um, Any discussion on that? No, it's a good thing. No. Yeah. Good I mean, this is this uh, in October. We have the um, the basically the energy fair, mm -hmm. yeah. and you know that the what what are the dates again? Do we, uh, the October twenty seventh, I believe. October twenty seventh. Twenty seventh, twenty eighth. It's yeah. being held in the Baptist Church gym right. on Glen Allen, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it should be a good turnout. I mean, this is an exciting yeah. project, to Synergize mm -hmm. Bridgewater. Um, Deputy Mayor Tanner and I are going to a conference in France hosted by the city that houses Michelin's head office. And uh, I've been asked to speak at that conference on the Energize Bridgewater initiative wow. to all those attending the conference. So this is not just little Bridgewater trying to find its way on its own or or something that's recognized provincially or even nationally this is internationally that that this initiative um, has garnered some interest so it's it's very exciting yeah. to be speaking at a, a conference where they have experts from all fields regarding sustainable energy use and we're one of the one of the people speaking so I'm, I mean that's pretty I'm excited for our community yeah. so um, Yes, so with motions on the floor, ready for the question. Yep. Next question is being called. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Uh, tender 17-07E, King Street Upgrades. Um, so uh, we have a little bit of a challenge with this project. Um, just an update for the public that uh, through the federal government, there was infrastructure money put in place for municipal units within a certain time frame for certain projects on the front uh, on the surface that seems like a really great thing because there's infrastructure money for communities like us the flip side of that is that every community from coast to coast has a limited window in which to put in bids for money for infrastructure projects which means every contractor that works on these types of projects knows that if they don't get this one, they'll get the next one or the next one or the next one, which in what we've seen today has driven the price up substantially. Um, I don't know, Mr. Feener, if you want to speak to that. Um, uh, uh, no, other than we understand that uh, we're not the only ones that are seeing, you know, the, um, the over budgeted amounts in the vicinity of 25, 30% is not uh, unheard of. Um, we're just, uh, I guess, another one of those. Um, municipalities. Yeah. Councillor Thorburn. Of those, this project is over by 30%. How many are continuing on and how many are stopping? That I do not know. Can we find out? Possibly. Or do we need to know? We don't yeah. need to know. I, I think that we could probably find out just through our own channel speaking to our colleagues across the province. Yeah. I mean, it's an, it would be interesting to know. It would be interesting to know. Um, because if a lot of them are turning these projects down, yeah. then perhaps there's, a, there's the ability to go back, to pressure the federal government to give us more time to go back, mm -hmm. and the prices would change. But I, I think maybe the mechanism is through us speaking to our, our municipal colleagues around the province. Council. Could that be yeah. something um, to approach the UNSM about, yep. as, as kind of a unified, to find out who's uh, facing the same challenge, and then they can take all that information, approach, approach the provincial government with the issue that exists? Yeah, Mr. Smith, maybe we could... could we yeah, we could pop something out the AMA listserv. Uh, the, yeah. question, the question is, any, any towns over what percentage, 30%? It's like, you have to be specific. I guess there's more than one yeah. question. The first question is, are all the other units seeing these 25 to 30% in overages? Yeah. And, and if they are, are they going ahead with these projects, or are they Can't doing what yeah. we're, uh, what staff is recommending, which is saying, we're not going ahead with this project because yeah. it's way too far over budget. So I think it's really both yeah. 
proposed questions. Would you like to have a motion? I would, please. I move the Town Council of the Town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendation of staff that tender 17-070 e King Street upgrades not be awarded at this time and staff consult with the funding partners to explore whether there are opportunities to fund other projects. I have a seconder, please. Councilor Thorburn. Any further discussion? Question, Question being called. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Uh, next item is RFP 2017-05 supply of used bucket truck 2010 or newer. Um, and there's, uh, I understand from the documentation that because the uh, original tenders were for basically n much newer trucks that were without outside of our price range, you were able through um, consult, uh, consulting our legal to go back and get maybe a little bit of an older truck and hence the recommendation for a 2009 truck. Correct. Okay. <laughs> it just seems funny to read the subject of 2010 or newer and then the motion is going to be for a uh, 2009 truck. So just for <laughs> full transparency and disclosure to the public. If someone willing to make the motion, Councilor Fragier. Yes, Your Worship, that Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater endorsed the recommendation of staff and award RFP 2017 uh, 05 supply of used bucket truck 2010 or newer to McFarland's truck and utility for the purchase of one used. 2009 International 4400 with Altec L4M 45M boom for 37,900 plus HST 43,585 full HST or net 39,524 and 39 cents. You have a seconder, please. Councilor Thorburn. Uh, any discussion? Larry. Uh, can we have a picture? I, I, I think this truck is bigger than what I'm assuming is an ordinary little bucket truck. Is it a great big international truck that it, used to use construction? It's uh, still a single axle. It's, it's still a single axle, yeah. It's a Nova Scotia Power, actually, from the local office uh, truck. Uh, one of the differences from what we were looking at is um, this one does have stabilizers yes. that do uh, stick out about uh, 16, 18 inches on each side when they're down, uh, should they need to be down. Um, so it, it is a little bit larger than what we were looking for originally. I guess the other advantage is it does have a longer boom. Um, that does allow us to, to reach a little farther. Uh, as an example, this one, we um, actually reached the, uh, the lights on the ball field in the <coughs> Kingsman, whereas the smaller truck, we wouldn't have been able to do that. Yeah. Is there so, some small areas where you can't get that into where it's so big? Uh, I'm we, sure there is. It, uh, there would be some of the uh, busier streets, perhaps, yeah. but um, you know, perhaps if we were to park close to the curb, the stabilizer could be on the sidewalk. So um, I, I don't think we don't feel it would be a big impact. Okay. Good. Councilor McDonald. There's no issue with the bridge surface, the width? Not the width, no. That makes it sound like there's another issue with the bridge surface. Uh, no, no, well, no. there's, there's no, the perception that weight's an issue um, because there used to be signs posted, uh, and signs were posted because of the turning radius and not necessarily the weight of the, of the bridge. Are you oh, referring okay. to yeah. um, the old bridge, I assume? Or yes. Th yeah. there, may, uh, there may still be a requirement to close uh, say the old bridge if we were working on it, but we've had to do that before as well. Okay. Okay. Councillor Gray. I guess I know you went through legal, but everybody else was was contacted to, to provide a, a, an updated quote or, or look at their inventory. Well, n the process is that uh, we are able to uh, negotiate with the uh, with the, the the submissions, the two submissions that we had. Okay. So further negotiate. Okay. Good. Any further? Questions? Ready for the question? Question. Question. question being called. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Um, tender 17 08 E, Bridgewater Skate Park. Um, let's, uh, Councillor McDonald, do you want to put this motion on the, f on the floor? I do. First? <laughs> uh, I would move the Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater accept the recommendation of the Engineering Department and award tender number 17 08 E, Bridgewater Skate, por skate Park to ProPort Concrete Services Incorporated for a lump sum of $517,500, $469,287 net HST. Seconder, Deputy Mayor Tanner. 
Um, before I open that, uh, Mr. Feener, did you want to talk about the um, the tender? I had a, a, a quick summary um, regarding, I, I mean, the information's in the report. Uh, the tender that was issued was centered around concrete uh, work with some uh, minor grading, uh, site grading. Uh, we were working with some local contractors to get prices for tree removal, grubbing, and um, I'll say rough grading. Uh, we didn't finalize those details. Um, we had uh, prices from two suppliers and we were working to get more prices. They came in higher than we anticipated. Uh, from what we understand, there's no, uh, there's not the value in the wood that we were expecting, and uh, both the contractors indicated the same. Um, so those values are coming back higher than we anticipated. Okay. I guess on balance, this this would certainly put the project over budget, um, because the we're, we're basically talking about two components of the the project here. The bowl, which is the the pro pour uh, award, and then the grubbing, which is the additional fifty nine thousand or whatever. So, and and we do still need from Larry and I's discussion the other components of the project, which are things like parking lot and signage and all that sort of thing. So, you know, if these two recommendations are approved tonight, then the it's anticipated the project would probably be about one hundred and five thousand over and then we're short on the fundraising so it'd probably be in the vicinity of two hundred thousand dollars so you know and i know that the committee is continuing to fundraise because that's all based on sandy's report jennifer's just reported tonight that we've got another ten thousand so that that would take that down but council should be aware that this would bring the project over budget to follow up on that question uh will we agreed by motion to make up the shortfall how much are we talking well that that's just uh, it because the, the we're, we're on the hook <coughs> for 400,000 originally our grant from the provincial government was less than half of what we asked for and that's that's in the numbers I've just given you so with including the numbers from the provincial government the shortfall based on the information Sandy had provided back in July June, June. Um, we would probably be about 99,000 so call it a hundred thousand short on the fundraising with the original budget yeah now the committee is continuing to fundraise they, they've got another 10,000 so so say we were 90,000 short on the fundraising but we're also going to be over budget in the vicinity from what we can tell at this point another hundred thousand yeah. so it's a couple it's two hundred thousand two hundred thousand dollars in my right, books. at this point yeah. that that hopefully would be fundraised, but if council, if, if it's not fundraised, then council has to fund it because it's our project. Yeah. I'm just trying to get clarification of the numbers. So when I go back, just reading the minutes from um, that of the Bridgewater Skate Park update uh, that we got on June 15th for the report. So the motion that that council made was Phase one was up to five hundred thousand, <coughs> and we would cover the shortfall. Was that right? Is that so? Phase two. No, we're not even. Talking we're not even about in phase two, two, but we're just talking about, about phase, phase one. one. So, so uh, anything over five hundred thousand, um, just going back to the original motion, uh, we would have to backstop as well. Okay. So, so there's there's two components to the risk here. The first is that. Even with a five hundred thousand dollar budget, yeah, there was a hundred thousand dollar shortfall in right. the funding. Right. Okay. Now we're saying with this tender and with the grubbing and everything, we're looking at probably if everything else goes according to plan, another hundred thousand dollars over. Just for phase so one. To right. Okay. Right. Every Mayor Tan. Larry, I thought at one point in time we had talked about engineering doing some of the clearing, earthwork, grubbing, <coughs> that, that just become a capacity issue or, I mean, we're not going to save money, so to speak, but 
We, we've considered that. Um, I'd say capacity issue is, is, is the primary reason we're not doing it, but we also don't really have the right equipment uh, to remove the trees uh, efficiently. Okay. Um, we actually have a staff member that's been in the business and uh, had him look at it thinking that we may actually do that work and, and he suggested that uh, it would probably be um, more economical to have the people in the business to do it. Okay. I guess part B of that perhaps is if the uh, skate park committee could find an organization, a uh, business to do this work in kind, is that allowed under our rules or how does that work as a sponsorship component? Kind of? Provided they are properly insured. Um, yeah, I, I'm not. I, I'm not seeing anything that would prohibit it, but okay. because they're not asking someone to donate the concrete, that that's going up to tender. It's the other component. Yeah. So we would, you know, record it as a project cost, but also as a funding source. Okay. And I should mention as well that um, the original $500,000 budget had 20000 for project management in it, which engineering is going to do the project management. So there is that saving that's included in the numbers that I provided. Okay. Councillor Graves. The company Propor, I guess they're the people that do all the skateboard parks in the area? Uh, yes, they seem to be one of the main suppliers yes and I guess the pricing say on based on a square footage it seems to be in line with everybody else in terms of Liverpool and yes. Chester that's and my understanding yes okay. hmm. Any further discussion mr. Smith can we just run through the numbers again the total cost and because I'm trying to reconcile them online it was it was the total project, including the grubbing, is roughly 60 plus net HST 470. 470 plus 60 is 530. Right. Yes. But yeah. there are additional components that were included in the original budget that still have to be done, yeah, like the parking lot and all that. That's phase two. But no, 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 no. Parking lot has to be done. Parking one. lot oh, and all that oh, is phase okay. one. The parking lot component, is that completed and paved? Is that what's no, listed in the? Paved. I think it's just gravel. Just gravel. Just gravel. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> and there is a $30,000 contingency in there, but you know, that may very well be required once you get into the tax we have to pay. Also, doesn't you know doesn't preclude us from applying for the same grant next year that we received this year, that was made clear by Director of Parks and Rec. So we will be continuing to applying for grants, grant after grant after grant. Um, Councilor Thorburn, Mary, uh, with this new skate park going in up there that we we approved. Uh, have we looked at the soil cover up there to find out that we're not going to get the ledge and have to spend lots of money preparing this for installation? There, there was a geotechnical completed on the uh, on the site, and the design took that into consideration. Um, you're not going to see the deep, deep bowls like you may see in other locations. Okay. Um, they're kind of an intermediate bowl uh, because of that. Yeah. Well, I just think of back on Empire Street when we started going up there and. We couldn't put the brakes on to it, and it was about three times of what it should have been because of the ledge and rock and whatnot. So there is rock there, yes. Okay. Councilor McGinnis. As you all know, I did not <coughs> vote for the last motion for the funding arrangement that was put in place, and I'm not going to support any motion that's put forward here tonight to increase that, obviously. Uh, most people around the table know my views that I don't think the municipality has contributed what the amount of money they should have contributed to this project, among others, but this one in particular. Uh, I, I think we should probably make some approach to them, indicating maybe the, this project might be in jeopardy, 
and where it will be used probably at least 60 to 70 percent by the residents of the municipality they might want to step up and help us out here this is a this is a critical point but I think we'll make that we'll make that pitch to them regardless of what happens tonight if the motion uh, is approved and the, the tender awarded and it goes ahead then I, I, I believe I made that clear when we when we made the original uh, motion to go ahead with this project that the municipality in my opinion uh, one that I share with you they have not um, contributed to this project to the amount that they should um, it reminds me of the old arena um, it reminds me of the library um, had this discussion with a resident the other day who had a little bit of a concern who does not live in town and wondered why they should pay what they pay for the LCLC <laughs> as they were coming out of the library <laughs> and I reminded them that the town and the residents of the town funded 100% the building of the library and continues to fund the operation of the library with no assistance from the municipality yet we know over 60% of the users of the library come from the municipality of the District of Lunenburg. So when we look at a project like this, it's not, we're not equally yoked here and we need to be uh, stronger partners and that's gonna require a little bit more of a step up financially from the municipality. I appreciate that they went from 40 to $80,000, but we're looking at a $500,000 plus project here. So we need a little bit more. Uh, Councilor Thorburn and then Deputy Mayor. Just, just one more question and, and, and for clarity. Uh, if we do the project and, and approve the motion tonight by a majority, however that may be, and the project is done, you, do you think the province will come and give us money after the project's done? I do. That's not typical. No. In my five years in council that they would give additional funding to a project that was completed. They, they, have they in the may past. give funding for phase two. That's not done. They... they Governments have covered some of the overages on King Street after the project was almost complete. Right, we had a two hundred thousand. That was two hundred thousand dollars we received from the province or the federal government McCoa, yeah. from Macoa for the overages downtown. So, because yeah, normally you're right. Normally you're right there. <laughs> anyway, they know, but I'm 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 trying to be hopeful and optimistic. Oh, well, I hear you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, two hypotheticals, and perhaps Ken will have to help with this. Uh, if this motion is defeated tonight, does that mean we have to go out to RFP again if we want to restart this project? I'll let the town engineer answer uh, that one, basically. Uh, fortunately, I don't have the document, but normally they're, it says in the document that they're valid for 30 to s or 60 days. Okay. The, the, I guess the concern is the lateness of the year and if it's going to be constructed prior to bad weather. Sure, then you're into spring. And I'm not sure if that would affect any of the funding partners or not. It I affects the grant from the province because um, yes. they can't guarantee that we get the money next year was okay. what I think Sandy told us. If this motion were deferred until our next council meeting, what does that do to the timeline to give us some time to perhaps talk to our funding partners? They already uh, indicated that, uh, based on this schedule, that they feel the concrete could get done, but any of the limited surrounding work would probably not be done till spring. So I would suggest that uh, delay in ultimately could suggest the concrete work wouldn't get done as well. So if only the concrete work is getting done this year, and the rest of the work is getting done next year does that give us enough time to start working with our partners the the, the rest of the work is some limited landscaping just along around the edges of the concrete oh, okay. yeah it's not uh, anything significant mr smith i think the province expected a substantive amount of commitment to the project which would be your concrete work that's that's the big part of it and if yeah. we went ahead with that the rest of the things they could get by with the March 31st, 2018 deadline. So, and 
unless we get going at the project, uh, it's pretty pretty risky that the province will pick up. And and the weather's well, the engineer can explain more, but the weather the lo longer we leave it, it puts the uh, concrete work at risk too. Councilor McDonald. Would it be correct to say that the driveway does need to be completed in this building year to allow access, um, but the, par the parking lot could be spraying, some of those things might be able to be shifted? Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, as long as there's access. Um, we, okay. We've actually installed a culvert for the driveway and we've roughed it into the fundraising sign. I believe that may have gotten finished over the weekend um, just because we were doing other work. and. Right. That was an area to um, to use our surplus fill. Right. Um, so as long as there's an area to park, I was, I was just kind of looking at the list. I mean, obviously, rural signs are important. Um, there was some there's some budget for benches and trash receptacles. You know, we probably would have a picnic table or something on hand uh, for the interim. Um, they're very small. Yeah, they're very small ticket items. The paper clips. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the parking area, w there will be a parking area because part of the uh, of the work would be to um, grade the site, mm -hmm. uh, basically starting from a level a level point. So there'd be an area there that, uh, you know, perhaps some very minimal gravel in the interim or something. Uh, Councilor Brazier. Um, just going back to the numbers once again, um, so the original motion that was made was up to 500,000 that that council would um, cover the shortfalls. So if we're saying tonight, putting the motion on the table with regards to uh, pro poor concrete services and the total amount that exceeds the 500,000. So do we have to rescind the motion that was already made? No? Okay. Okay. We're just checking on okay. that. Councilor McDonald. I, I, I think I asked this of Larry the, in, in our last meeting where, where this issue was brought up. Um, there's a certain threshold in which if you, do, if you turn down the tender and say we're not going to do the work, you could be open to liability. Are we falling in there? Are we risking it if we say we're not going to do it? Typically, that threshold's 15%. Uh, I guess the question here is what portion of the budget would be allocated for the concrete work? That okay. could be the, the challenge. Right, OK. Could I just revisit the numbers one more time? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we committed two hundred thousand dollars a couple of three years ago, and it looks like for the remainder we're looking at another two hundred thousand, pending what the fundraising does. We just did a uh, on a, and that's on the five hundred thousand dollars or the total project. That'd be the, the total. The total. No, no, no. It was the final. Sorry, First phase, phase one, yeah. but with the increased. The over budget taken yep. into account. Okay. Based on what we know now. Yeah. Um, just to go back to Councilor Fraser's question, so the motion uh, we did discuss the five hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and in the minutes it does talk about mm -hmm. that five hundred thousand dollars and anything like kind of up to that. But the motion just says anything over, we will okay. backstop. Yeah, the shortfall we will we will backstop. There's no there's no mention um, of any upper limit to of the amount. Of any ceiling amount. No. Okay. No. Councillor Thorburn. Well, this original motion that, that I'm reading on here is only asking for four hundred sixty nine thousand two hundred eighty seven thousand dollars, which is under the five hundred thousand dollars in the first place. That's true, but but. Well, that's what I'm reading. Right. But then the next motion is for. 60. 
and <laughs> we're just making you aware that yeah. there are other pieces too. So it's in two, oh, yeah. par two parts. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm yeah. just saying that yeah. most that I'm looking at. Yeah, you're, the first motion is great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get her done. Uh, Councilor Graves. Do we have to put out another RFP for the grubbing and clearing? And so in the next motion, it it, um, it okay. does explain that um, the motion is to give pro for, for the How's ability that? to negotiate clearing and grubbing work to a maximum price. Okay. And if they can't, then it will be awarded to the lowest bidder that we've already received quotes from. Okay. But we'll we'll deal with that one in a second. We do have a motion on the floor now to yeah. deal with the uh, to deal with the first one. Ready for the question? Questions. Questions being called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Um, so, very timely, Councillor Graves, your question. So, the next, uh, we have another motion on there. Would you like to make that motion, Councillor Graves? I see it there now. I move the Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater approve an option with the successful bidder, Pro Court, to negotiate for the cleaning, uh, sorry, clearing and grubbing work to a maximum of 60,000 net HST, otherwise that the clearing and grubbing contract be awarded to the lowest of the already received quotes. And a seconder, please. Councilor McDonald, <laughs> any discussion on that? Um, yeah. So that's, sure. that's, they do the prep work before and after the concrete? Is that the understanding? Before. before. This, so the the, this option potentially gives us the ability to discuss with the concrete contractor to also uh, um, um, provide the service of removing the trees, removing the stumps, leveling the site. Okay. Before, Before the work begins. Before the, uh, yeah. yes. okay. And then afterwards, landscaping is a separate That's part, part of, of the this original. Um, okay. Work minimal landscaping um, that the pro port. Yeah, there's, there was some minimal landscaping as part of that. Okay. We have a motion on the floor. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Questions being called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Um, we're down to 10.8, which is our addition, which is tender. Uh, What's well, the North Parkade repair update? This has uh, been ongoing for a bit in the summer, and there was communication that came out through our um, communication coordinator uh, to the merchants and to the public explaining some of the reasons for the delay. And uh, if Mr. Feener, you'd like to maybe give the update on some of the other issues that we're facing on the North Parkade. Uh, sure, Your Worship. Um, further to the award of the tender for the repairs, um, we obviously want to provide an update. The work began uh, with the removal of the asphalt in the entranceway to expose the concrete deck. Um, we found that the deterioration of the concrete deck was actually worse than um, expected or assumed during the original tender. Uh, we concluded that we had to focus on the entrance because of the degree of deterioration um, and that the minor repairs in the other areas of the uh, parkade would be done, uh, I'll say, in a temporary means, not in the same means as we're doing now, to help reduce costs and to address the significant safety hazards that uh, still would exist. Um, Council also requested uh, additional information in a previous meeting and explore options for future repairs and maintenance prior to next year's budget. Uh, Council did approve a rail beautification project of $60,000 as, as part of the capital uh, project program. Um, we do anticipate that these repairs will be done by the end of the month. Um, as of just recently, they've uh, finished removing the, the deteriorated concrete within the entrance, so they have to clean and prep and then pour concrete, let it set for about six days to to uh, harden uh, before use so they seem to be on on track with uh, the end of the month which is what they had proposed in the uh, original tender uh, the cost to do the entrance alone is uh, about sixty nine thousand dollars it's a square foot cost um, so we'll 
do the final measurements at the end of the uh, repairs. It, that would be about $14,000 over the approved budget. Um, other repairs in the other areas may be in the range of ten to 15000 uh, depending on how many we have to do. Um, we do recommend that Council consider um, uh, deferring the rail project to help offset the cost of this work as well as give us uh, an opportunity to get the information that Council had asked for uh, prior to next year's budget. And if you refresh your screen, you'll see there is a motion there to, def to uh, defer that cost to offset that. Um, if you recall, when we were doing our public bu budget deliberations, we did talk about, uh, as, as the town engineer mentioned, the future of the North Parkade and what the options are from, you know, do we, year after year we tend to do little repairs. Do we want to continue doing that? Do we want to have a full reset of the decking and what does that cost? Um, so options will be coming for us. So it, it, in my opinion, it makes sense not to do a $60,000 rail beautification and then get one of the best options to come to council that we totally remove all the decking in the next couple of years and redo it and damage a brand new rail. So um, I think it makes sense to not beautify a structure that we may want to undo. I don't mean remove it like we did the South Parkade, but make changes to or substantial changes. So that's, um, that's kind of along the lines of what the town engineer is proposing and, and it, it makes sense. Um, and just again for the public, uh, part of the delay is that we did not anticipate the entrance would be in the condition that it was in. So it was something that needed to be addressed and it needed to be addressed now we couldn't put it off so it kind of set us back a little bit uh, there was also a, a delay in the breakdown of the machine where um, they had thought they could get source parts from toronto but they actually had to come from the states it's a very specialized machine yeah. councillor yeah i just had a question about the railing um were there any safety concerns there with the railing or was i know council had approved the the beauty vacation of the replacement of the rail but I'm just wondering if, uh, if there was any concerns with safety I know those would be addressed on a on a different uh, level but just just a general question we, we have re replaced a couple of the sections earlier this year um, prior to Canada Day I believe it was okay. yeah. so there's no no issues with delaying overall then no catch no. okay. totally nothing to do with the project <laughs> but very important to the project, is, are we going to upgrade the power so the next time we have a fair or something on that North Barricade, is there going to be something coming forward for us to put the proper power service to that North Barricade? There's nothing in the budget for that, uh, nor uh, I, there, there was a capital project um, yes, that was proposed and I'd have to review the the long list to see where it would fall in the program if it's nice. still on the list so perhaps when the when the options come to council um, in the next few months I'm hoping um, because this is an item that, yeah. that comes up mm -hmm. maybe including that um, could just be you know if you want to do the the full meal deal including upgrading power that the power component is X and even if there's a couple of options, if you wanted to do power across the whole parkade, it's this, or if you wanted to just do it in one corner, I, th I think that, I think it's important to know. Yeah, um, it certainly is. Any other questions before we put a motion on the floor? I'm, I'm looking forward to getting the options so that we can hopefully go down the path of addressing this. Um, when I was, when I had a meeting with, with Larry and Justin, uh, I think it was Justin that made a really good point that the original concrete for this was poured in the 70s. And in the grand scheme of things, it has served us very, very well. I think it's easy to, 
to drive on the parquet to look in, in I mean it's atrocious now but it's 40 years old um, so it should look the way it looks based on its use and its age so it's not a it's it's not that it's been neglected it's not that something went wrong it's 40 years of concrete that has, it needs it needs to be changed so um, I just kind of want to mention that for the public it's not engineering or public works or someone not doing their job it's it's old <laughs> and it breaks down <laughs> I'm about the same age as the concrete and <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're prepared to make a motion please Councilor Frazier Sure, Your Worship, that Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater endorsed the recommendation of staff that the rail beautification project budgeted for 60000 be deferred to help offset the additional cost to repair the deck this year and allow staff and council time to evaluate options for the park aid for the next budget year. Can I have a seconder, please? Councilor McDonald, any further discussion? Question. Questions being called. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Down to business arising and unfinished business, an update on our transit pilot project. And our junior transit planner, Mackenzie Childs, is here to give us an update. And uh, welcome, Mackenzie. I just wanted to, this I believe is Mackenzie's first time uh, perhaps meeting many of you on council. And we were very excited when she started with us at the beginning of July. And so we have uh, graciously asked her if she would present to you uh, around where we're at. Thank you. Nice to meet everyone. Um, so just going through um, a couple presentation points from operational to more specifics and um, about the promotional materials and how we're informing the community um, through the different stages. Um, so for operational, um, interviews have been completed to secure qualified drivers. Uh, 18 uh, qualified drivers applied and training is currently being scheduled with King's Transit. Um, as for ticket sales, uh, locations have been confirmed with business owners, um, a handful of them, and currently we're determining safe and efficient ways to track the sales, so we're, we're in the process of um, determining that right now. Um, so some of you might already be familiar with the route more or less. Um, this is just kind of the the general area and um, we're focusing on having stops at many of the key locations that were addressed through the uh, community feasibility report and the schedule uh, allows a lot of employees to get to the town's largest employers for their shifts and we do acknowledge that um, for some of the later shifts um, in some of the businesses we won't be able to accommodate that during the pilot project but it's definitely something that's important to look into for later. Uh, and as for the fares, um, this is kind of a rundown on those. Um, and yeah, so straightforward, single ticket is $2, um, and the 10 and, ride, 10 and 30 ride passes um, have two different options there as well. Um, and the student uh, is also a youth one, so anyone who is a youth or student. And we were looking at a six month pass, which is still an option, but we're unsure what this will look like um, at the moment. Um, we're looking at different options for that. Uh, and we're also looking into lower income passes, um, perhaps provided by other services. I've been in contact with community services and um, uh, various others. And through be best practice research, um, we noticed that um, monthly passes um, are fairly restrictive to users um, due to the time limit. So that's why we went with a 30 ride pass instead. And they're slightly more difficult administratively. Um, just some examples um, for Yarmouth, for example, they have sold um, just a handful of their monthly passes over the time their system has been up. And um, a, an example we are looking at is um, Bracebridge in Ontario, and they do have a monthly pass, but we noticed that a lot of the monthly passes are actually on um, an electronic card, um, which is another thing to look into for the future that would be interesting, um, but uh, a little bit easier with that system. And so the general hours of operations here, Monday to Friday, 6 until 9. Uh, Saturday 8 until 7 and Sunday 9 until 5 um, and we're looking at the lumberjack games as well um, they happen on Fridays and Saturdays and there's 24 of them um, that are home games um, throughout the course of the pilot project so we're looking at the possibility of perhaps extending the service for that um, when we can always promote it as kind of a separate um, initiative as well which would kind of get people more interested in that 
Uh, so I think all of you are aware that it was in the South Shore X parade. Um, so we received the buses, have the Bridgewater branding, um, and this was the first time the bus was presented to the community. Um, so we're working on various promotional and informational materials, including a brochure, which has your standard things such as the hours of operation, uh, the route schedule, the route map, and fares. The ride guide is much more detailed, um, including how to load a bike, how to ride the bus, everything you kind of need to know. Uh, we've worked on a message to drivers um, because we know behavior change is a big part of implementing a bus system. So not only catering to the people who will be riding the bus, but the people who will be driving on the road uh, with it. And so we're uh, uh, providing those to Access Nova Scotia and some different driving schools as well. And uh, the website is currently being worked on as well. And these materials are being created while taking into consideration visual engagement, uh, making sure they're easy to read, um, and also visual accessibility is a big part. Um, so we've had some meetings uh, with Ellen Johnson um, to discuss CNIB guidelines, and we'll, we, we will receive inputs um, on the designs from her and a few more people just to make sure they are legible, including the website, um, for pe people with visual impairments. And we're looking into large format brochures um, to provide at uh, seniors' homes um, and perhaps some other locations as well. And we've been informing the community in various ways, in person, uh, social media, which has started and will be ongoing throughout the entire project, uh, the South Shore, South Shore Exhibition Parade, uh, Ribfest, we provided postcards to distribute there, and um, there will be some upcoming print and radio media, including the Bridge article, which will be coming out in September. Uh, we do have some confirmed presentations at senior care homes, um, which people are very enthusiastic about, and we are currently organizing presentations and information sessions with accessibility advocate groups as well, just determining a date. Uh, we will be having an informational brochure at NSCC once school starts in September, and we're providing them um, informational material for all of the orientation packages. Uh, connections have been made with the junior senior high school staff and an engagement uh, session is planned, J a date just has to be determined. And we are, uh, I've reached out to Parkview staff and just awaiting to hear back about the possibility of an engagement session with them. Another note on Parkview as well, um, connections have been made directly with staff to determine their extracurricular hours and accommodate best we can uh, with the bus schedule. And we are looking at doing an engagement video uh, to show people how to use the bus, how easy it is, and accessibility options that are available. Uh, we have confirmation with Small World Learning Center, and we are awaiting confirmation from some other parties to participate in that. And the launch date is set for September 25th. And that's, yeah, the summary of everything there. I'm, I'm impressed with what you've done so far. Yeah. Like the, well, first of all, I'm really impressed you were four minutes like on the nose. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I'm just impressed with, like you listed out the connections that you've made and, and the engagements that you've had already. So um, I think I'm, maybe I shouldn't be surprised. I'm just kind of surprised that, that what you've done, because you haven't been here that long. So, you know, hats off to you for that. Councilor McGinnis. Yeah, question. Uh, I know we don't have it, and I'm just wondering if we should. Uh, there's no camera inside the bus. There is. There's multiple cameras yeah. inside the bus. Oh, there the is. Bus. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. We have to figure out exactly how that will be working, yeah. uh, but they are there. Okay, good. Yeah. That's, that's, that's great. I think I noticed three in, when we were looking around the parade, okay. yeah. Other questions, Deputy Mayor Tanner? Mackenzie, how do we know if this is a success, a failure, uh, yeah. halfway in between? Um, we're working on that right now, um, looking at how we're going to monitor the progress. Um, so, obviously, we're looking at that a little bit right now, focusing on actually implementing it at the moment. Um, but we have um, some surveys and some different methods of monitoring are starting to be um, uh, worked on right now. And we're going to be looking at w how people see the service before the pilot project and during the pilot project as well. And there are different ways um, through ticket sales and um, just connections with the bus driver as well that we're going to be monitoring where people um, get on and off the bus and how many tickets and passes are being purchased as well. Jessica, you might have something to yeah. add. I just want to add that we've also, we've partnered with uh, the School of Planning at Dalhousie and University and they're helping us to develop surveys uh, that would go out um, via SurveyMonkey, also possibly getting some volunteers to sit on the bus and talk to people as they get on and, and ride the bus. Um, and we're planning to deploy a pre-launch survey, so early September, 
Uh, just a general one, I just got the draft today, I haven't had a chance to review it, but just around basic travel habits and try to establish uh, some baseline. And then we'll do another survey after about three months. Uh, so in early January, again, talking, that would go out to all residents, um, but just, again, identifying, um, you know, if it's had an impact on travel behavior, et cetera. So we have that type of information to go with rider numbers, uh, ticket sales, et cetera, so that we, we have a fairly robust uh, framework. So she's helped develop, so what are the, the outcomes that we want to see? Uh, what are those indicators? And how would we measure those indicators? And is developing a survey around that. I think that's great. I guess mm -hmm. I was looking for more benchmarking against similar mm -hmm. communities. So how, how, what's our volume compared yeah. to Yarmouth? What's our volume compared to King's Trail? That will be part of that. Okay. And, and we can't, you know, obviously I can't say what the benchmark is, is right now. We'll be looking at other similar size systems. Um, we had that question. We just met with uh, this professor last week. She came down so she could see Bridgewater. Um, and, uh, and we talked about, you know, what is that... Um, you know, what, what sort of percentage ridership or, or sort of thing are we, are we aiming for to say this is really successful? We're going to reach out to the province that funds uh, systems of different sizes right across the province and ask them, you know, what, what their benchmark is for success and, and build off that. Councillor McDonald. Uh, this may be on your to-do list, but I'm just wondering if you've opened the lines of communication with other transportation providers just to continue feedback with them on how it's impacting or affecting their business. Um, what kind of partnerships or, or arrangements mm -hmm. can be made to make sure that both are benefiting from this and, and one isn't being hurt by the other? Are you referring to taxi? Could to be. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's on my list. Yeah. yeah. So we've talked about it. We them. haven't reached out directly to the taxi, uh, the taxis yet. I guess there wasn't one overarching uh, group. Um, but what's, what's interesting, we did talk about that actually at length with the Dal Prof, and she said, you know, transit generally supports taxi service because it doesn't replace the door-to-door -door. Right. Uh, and there's still going to be that need so um, you know experience from other communities is that it's been supportive and so we we've, we've identified that in some of the you know what we need to look at uh, in terms of our evaluation but we haven't reached out directly so we'll add that onto our our Mackenzie's to-do list <laughs> uh, I had that on my my calendar for the next couple of weeks to just have a meeting in town hall with all the taxi owners to kind of go over the transit system so that they're not afraid of it because I I mean they coexist in in every large city right. in the world and it's um, I think it can be a complementary use to their business mm -hmm. especially that the tax the taxis can go out of town <laughs> and we know that the bus will not go out of town so there is a, a benefit to them there it's very but important I have to have that conversation feel it's an attack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's interesting because I was thinking about this last week. Uh, who manages our taxi licenses in town and how many taxis are licensed in town? It's it, well, we because I know we it, had a, a it used to be Lisa and in conjunction with Jerome, Ash Ashley, so it's Jerome. Ashley and Jerome. So, how many taxis are licensed? I wonder currently, around what 15, 18, 15. Mm, okay. I don't quote me on that, but it, that it's it's not many. I think it's, uh, I think it's the higher end of that number. Okay. <coughs> And those are legal cabs. We'll have to also mention that we have an issue in town with cabs that are not legally operating. So that seems like a lot. Yeah. Councilor Thorburn. Yeah. Further to that, are, are we talking to Senior Wheels to make sure that, because we're not impacting on the service they provide either. And we can work as a partnership in hand to hand to make sure that we can assist them to assist us, help them, so that we're all helping each other. Councilor Fugere. Um I think it's great that you. Um, looked at the different opportunities with uh, the fairs and students, um, monthly passes and different options. One thing that I was hearing, we passed a lot of these out uh, during the parade and uh, some feedback I received was uh, about a senior rate. So I just uh, wanted to pass that along if that's been on your radar as well. <laughs> Thank I believe Councillor McGinnis brought that up over and over again. Looking for a senior Eight rate. Damn seniors want everything. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody Graves. has the senior rate. Yeah. Two dollars. Everybody gets the senior rate. Two bucks. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Graves. Uh, do you have an update on the cash boxes? Anything? We have to go to Kings to pick those up, and so that's part of our. Um, yeah, that's on our to-do list. So it's still Don't worry. There will be. They're uh, still donated. 
they're still donated and from same Kings. with the signage at the front of the bus they're donating yes yeah, so I, I will I will say that I was surprised with all the uh, various things that were remaining on the bus when we received them from Halifax Transit I wasn't expecting there we may not we need a bit of a lesson in terms of how it all works I think we're missing a few key parts to make some things work like perhaps a, a computer to make the cameras work um, but the the signage uh, is actually the destination signs are still there we're just missing the, the key cartridge that would allow us to program it with our own programs mm -hmm. so it could say yay transit and Bridgewater yeah. um, so that's that's exciting and those are things that we're, we're looking into uh, prior to launch that need to be ironed out mm -hmm. okay and have we reached out the community services yes yes yeah no, and you've had meetings with them no it was a recent reach out to them so I haven't heard back from them yet but Start my question. What year are those buses? Because I've read two or three different years in 2009. One 2009, 2009, 2009 GMC 5500 models. 2000. Yes. And nine. 2009. We can put a bucket on it. And then <laughs> bucket. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions? No. Nope. Oh, very. We're getting close. We're okay, mm -hmm. six weeks away from mm -hmm. launch. Is that is that what we're at? Six weeks away mm -hmm. around yes. that. So it's very exciting. <laughs> yes. So. Um, thank you for your presentation, Mackenzie, and we look forward to updates in the future. Thank you. You did good. Our next item is the second and final reading of Chapter 193, Parking Meter Bylaw. Um, there is a motion that needs to be put on the floor, so I'm going to make that, and we can have a discussion. I would move the Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater approve the second reading of the, chap of the Chapter 193, Parking Meter Bylaw, as per document 17-093A, adopt as bylaw and authorize staff to publish all public notices pursuant to section 168 of the Municipal Government Act. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Fragier. Uh, this is second reading. Um, no changes in this. Any discussion? This is not new to the community. Paid parking is back on in Bridgewater. I, I know this is your favorite topic, Council Well, no, no, I just indicated that I will not be supporting the motion because I did not support it the first time. Uh, I am still getting a lot of complaints about the back end parking. And, uh, and I see a lot of offenses because people don't either see the signage or understand the signage. And I would have thought by now there would be some improvement. I still see people going in, you know, forward. They're driving right in. Mm -hmm. I see them turning left and doing that. Uh, I also see them when they leave the parking, turning left and going north on King Street. Uh, and it, yeah, I know a lot of the merchants I talk to there think that it's, you know, it's it's really burdensome on, on a lot of people. And is there any consideration, or could there be any consideration to? having drive-in parking going down south and then back and back out into traffic. So you'd have to have the lines. You'd have to change the lines. You'd have to change the lines. And the bumpers? And the lines, crossing or coming traffic. No, no if you're you wouldn't going, be crossing. You're going south. If you're going, if south, you're going King, south, you drive in. You drive in, angled change parking. And then back out. Change the lines. Change. I think it's yeah. more than the lines, though. So we heard from staff that statistically backing back out in traffic is is more dangerous. Oh, I don't doubt that. I, um, I would agree it's dangerous. It's dangerous what's happening now. But I have a lot of people uh, to Councillor McGinnis's that just will not back in on King Street. They just will not. They are, they are actually avoiding and King Street. Because of the back in parking. parking. No, they can't parallel park either. No. Yeah. It's a sad testimony today. If, you, if, 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 anyway, if you're taking your driver's license, there used to be a requirement where you have to parallel, parallel park years ago no you don't that's not in the driver's exam anymore now there are other places people can park we do have the, the north parkade we do have the parking at pigeon Whisker park and we do have parallel parking spaces it does, but and I for the people who are driving in you were never ever allowed to cross that street when it was parallel parking and face that direction so there's no change in the direction that you have to face or the fact that you had to back up because when you parallel parked you had to back up because I get the same complaints. I had a letter, a few letters from the same individual who, who, um, who didn't understand how the parking worked. But 
got a ticket. Question, how was I supposed to know? Well, technically, anyone who has a license should know that you can't cross the center line to face the opposite way of traffic. So the, unfortunately, the, the, uh, the unpleasant answer is because if you have a license, you should have known. The, that's the blunt answer. And I agree. But, but, but it's an education on our part to the public. Where the lines, the way the line is situated, it invites people to do that. They should know they're not allowed, but there's a, they should know a lot of things. I do think we have a, a lack of signage. We have a sign at each end, but we mm -hmm. don't have any signage in the middle, and the signage is small, I think. Okay. Councilor McDonald. Uh, so uh, I think you're right. You don't have to parallel park in your road test anymore, but you do have to back up. So I'm going to assume that most people can, can back up their cars, and if they can't, then we're one of the few downtowns who has a choice of parking directions, regular parking lots, uh, parallel parking, angled parking. So uh, you know, if if you don't like one, you move on to the next. And I think I think we're actually pretty lucky to have a number of choices and options depending on your ability and skill level. <laughs> so you know, I'm I'm quite happy to, you know, if I'm not comfortable pulling into one of those spots, somebody's too close behind me, pulling forward and going into a parking lot. And, you know, we we do have pull in angle parking, on Phoenix as mm -hmm. well. So I mean. We've got three styles of parking on King Street. Councilor Graves. As a parent, um, once the, the, the construction was finished, the lines were painted, I took my, 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 new, my daughter, who's a new driver, and we went there on a Sunday morning, and we were there for about an hour, we practiced and practiced and practiced, got it down, and we're good to go. She's good to go. So that may I'd be lunch, an option. I had lunch in the new park today with my son, and it was the easiest parking I've ever done. It yeah. was. I put my signal on long in advance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The person behind me knew, and then I just backed in, and the space is so wide. I think part of the issue and part of the complaints that I've had, I've had people complain about the back end parking, and then when you drill down, you realize they've actually never done it. They've driven by it, and they've gone, they've gone past, and they've said, well, I'm not going to do it without trying it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's probably a large percentage of the people who say, I don't like reverse angle parking because they've never tried it. But it's easier than parallel parking, provided that the car behind you gives you space, which is not the fault of parking, because if we didn't make a change, it was parallel parking, you still can't back up then. I think, I think we need to educate the population, so I think that's the first step. We probably do need some increase in signage, because the signs are only at each end, and again, they are they're not huge. But at the end of the day, it's the safest way to park on a busy street, right? Yeah, I try not to walk down uh, down King, that section of King Street when there's people park backing in it, especially some of the older folks. Well, they're going to they're, take the bus gonna now because they're to take the bus. Is it possible to make more signage at eye level? I know there's height requirements with signs, but a lot of people will say they didn't even it's see like a sign, sign there. And, and when you look, at they're quite high up. I don't know what the regulations are with the signage, but. Um, if they could be more at an eye level, I don't know what the height requirements are on the signs. Uh, if, I, if it's council's wishes, we can have a look at the signage to see if there's options. Uh, I guess the question is, you know, how many signs is ad are adequate? Um, but we can look at the placement. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The other thing is, when we get the kiosks, I'm assuming there'll be something on the kiosk yeah. that says. Did you back in? <laughs> or if you drove in, <laughs> this won't be the only ticket that you get. <laughs> Something I like, like that. that. That's very <laughs> like cheeky. That. Yeah. There's also the, uh, the Senior Safety Advisor does a um, driver's training academy. And I don't want to say that it's only seniors that are afraid to back up their cars. I think it's probably uh, pretty mixed among the population. But the Senior Safety Academy, I believe, has um, added the reverse angle parking to their, um, their program to help educate seniors on how to actually do that and make, make sure that they're comfortable with it. So if, if you know any seniors who are uncomfortable with it, I, I, I would highly recommend that, that program to them. I think at the end of the day, it's change. Yeah. And for some, change is welcome and change is something that they enjoy because it's new. And for others, regardless of what the change is, if we did forward angle parking, you're gonna have someone say, Councilor McGinnis, backing into traffic is the hardest thing I've ever had to do. It's probably the same person that said backing into a parking space is the hardest thing I ever had to do. 
I don't think it's been open long enough that it's had a fair shot. We know in the first couple of weeks, probably eight out of 10 cars drove into the parking spaces, and now nine out of 10 are backing it. It's the odd one. One of them I know is a store owner that keeps coming in and pulling in, but I don't wanna go down the path of store owners and park. But I think it needs some time, it needs some education. I think we should maybe look at the signage None of us want to have it littered with signs like we have telephone poles on Glen Allen, but maybe there needs to be an increase in signage. I don't know what else we can do other than give it some time for people to get used to back in. I mean, the spaces are 150% of the width of a regular space. So you could pit almost two cars in the space. Give it a shot. Councilor Thurman. And I, and I agree with you because I've done both, and I'd sooner back in as Triumph Fairdale Park with the cars coming up on your bumper because you got the car beside you, it's easier to back in. The space is extra wide to start with and, and one cut and you're back in there. So. And that's if you're a decent driver, maybe, this bus, maybe you need help. Hey. That's why he walks. <laughs> um, yeah? Uh, could, could the police service perhaps spend a little time on foot down there and just as they see things? I mean, it's happening relatively regularly that if they spent a little bit of time down there, they might be able to just warn people and word would it help get word out and or ticket more people and word would certainly get out. So well, they are ticketing. Yeah. Um, I've had a few in the last couple of weeks, but we can talk about the messaging and, yeah. and that for sure. Um, we have a motion on the floor. I do have a question that kind of has to do with downtown. <laughs> that has nothing to do with this issue, but it's raised a little bit of confusion in the public. So under the Motor Vehicle Act, a bicycle is supposed to be ridden on the street. But on the river side of King Street, in front of the new park, there is a sign that says shared sidewalk with a bicycle and a person promoting riding the bicycle on the sidewalk, which I thought, again, was against the Motor Vehicle Act. So I've had, surprisingly enough, two calls in the last five days with people confused about where they're supposed to ride. And why would we not have people riding on the road? In the Motor Vehicle Act, there is a section that, uh, I'll say an exemption, provided the sidewalk or multi-use trail is um, um, signed, uh, that they can ride uh, on the sidewalk. Uh, the other location that I'm thinking of is in front of the Superstore. There's actually a line uh, that you're supposed to be on one side or the other, but provided it's signed uh, for that use, it is permitted. And is there a reason why we wanted to do that down there? That was part of the, the detailed design of that part of the downtown, was for that to be a multi-use trail and eventually to connect up to a larger multi-use trail. Were we maybe a little premature on putting the signs up? <laughs> yeah, it was part of the tender. Okay, I'm just, I, I found it, when I went down and looked at it, I also found it confusing and perhaps as we're trying to get people to ride their bikes and ride on the roads and have the sharrows on the roads and be more active, I'm, I'm, I'm worried we've done a bit of a disservice, but I'll leave that to people who are experts in this. I'm, not, I'm just passing the, just the messenger in this case. Are you ready for the question? question. <laughs> All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion's carried. Uh, chapter 193, parking meter, uh, parking meter bylaw metered zone. So this is the kind of the next part of this. Um, as you know, we have various locations around town that have parking meters, and so we have to um, we have to define that. And just as an update, this is not really changing from what we currently have in terms of metered zones. So there's there's no. Um, there shouldn't be anything raising red flags of the public with surprise parking meter areas that we didn't have before. Um, it does customers. add the spaces next to Bijinuiska Park, does it not? Yeah. It includes that within the metered zone that was discussed at council the last time we discussed parking. Um, and it, inc it includes uh, Dominion Street as well, which there is a uh, 10 minute limited parking in case so it includes some areas where there aren't meters right now but it's all the general area where meters have you know the general metered zone so that if council 
wishes to add more meters at a later time, it's all included within the, the metered zone, the downtown metered zone. So. Councilor Graves, did you have a question? Well, yeah, just the Victoria Road to Empire, but that's new. Is that's that new. There are no meters there. It's right. just included in part of the yeah. downtown metered zone just in case, but it doesn't mean that we're going to run out and stick meters there. That's not what's going to so happen. So somebody can park there at no charge? Yep, until, and, and yeah. from, from along Pleasant, from uh, Victoria through to Dominion Street, there are no meters. Yeah. That is that is free parking. Someone wish to put a motion on the floor, yep. please. Councilor Thorburn. Yep. I would move that Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendation of staff and in compliance with Chapter 193, Parking Meter Bylaw, set a metered zone within the town of metered parking as follows, as presented in Schedule A of Document 17-093B. Beginning to the south on King Street at Maple Street and continuing north on King Street inclusive of the east and west side to King Street at Victoria Road and beginning to the south on Pleasant Street at Dufferin Street and continuing north on Pleasant Street inclusive of the east and west side to Pleasant and Victoria Road, and Empire Street, Dominion Street, and Phoenix Street between King Street and Pleasant Street, and parking lots number 685 King Street, Town Center Lot, 580 King Street, North Parkade Lot, 480 King Street, Pinnacle Whiskey Park, and 399 King Street, O'Neill Lot, and 60 Pleasant Street, Town Hall Lot. I have a seconder, please. Councilor Frazier. Uh, any question for the discussion? No? You ready for the question? Question. All those in favor? Motion. Oh, sorry. Are those opposed? I almost forgot you, but can you cancel again? Sorry. Lest Motion. we forget. <laughs> it's carried. Uh, next item is RFP for audit services, and perhaps our Director of Finance will just give us a quick update on this one, please. Sure. Um, back in January of uh, January 23rd of 2017, uh, Council passed a motion that um, we would do an RFP for audit services uh, this coming fall for the 1718 uh, year end. Um, since that time, with, and with the wind up of the, the BDA, there are a number of complex accounting issues that we've been discussing with our current auditors, but of course won't. Um, land in the financial statements till the 1718 year and it's just thought that um, if we switch auditors this year that we would have to go through that again with another set of auditors and could get expensive so we're suggesting that uh, we defer the RFP by um, by year and uh, I guess that requires uh, a motion or Notification. Notice of motion. Notice of motion, motion to rescind, and then we would, then it would come back to the September 11th council. Yeah. So I'll just, it's just a statement that I make that, that the September 11th meeting, giving notice of motion to rescind that. So we don't need to vote on that, but that's coming at the next meeting. Any questions on that? Councilor Thurman. Do we know who made the motion, who set that motion back? And should we not have that information because it's important in our next meeting that we do have it? Because those are the people that have to rescind that motion. I understand. No? No. 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 Once it's not it is council's motion, and it is up to council to rescind it if they wish. It, is, uh, it doesn't belong to anyone once it's on the floor. Hmm. That's not the way I read it, but very in different interpretation. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Um, Municipal Joint Service Board Agreement Review. Um, kind of a long time coming, this review, and um, our partners are not addressing this until September, but we're going to address it now. And so uh, we can have the discussion first if there's any questions, or we can put the motion on the floor and then discuss it. But what is the will of council? I'm just throw it out there and have any any questions you have. Mr. Smith would be more than happy to answer them. <laughs> he told me earlier. I hope there's questions. I move the town council for the town of Bridgewater approve in principle the recommend recommended cha changes to the municipal joint services board agreement as presented in document 16-207F 
and direct staff to prepare the text amendments to the agreement. Thank you, Councilor Graves. Seconder? Oh, I'll second. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor McGinnis. Um, discussion. Some of the points, it's uh, some of it's housekeeping. Yeah. Some of it is text amendments to perhaps ease the comfort of some who feared that this was a body set up just to reach the end goal of amalgamation. Um, so that that's in the first text amendment, which is just to remove that wording. Uh, that was actually to, to add wording, because it was never in the original intention of the MJSB that it, um, that it be for amalgamation. But we went through this document with our partners and went through some of the changes, and I trust that council has gone through this, and if they have any concerns, uh, now is the time to raise them. No, I have no concerns. The, the only concern I have <laughs> would take upwards of nine to 10 months to make these minor changes. Yeah. It's, it's not been the most efficient process. No, it, it, it's, it's a little frustrating. Yeah. You know, I also feel that item 10 is gonna slow uh, this organization down even further than it's crawling at the moment. And um, I'm, I'm fearful that all of these different proposals and approvals by different levels are for a, just a review of a shared service is gonna uh, cause it some, quite a bit of angst going forward, so. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. Yeah. This document gets reviewed every four, four years. years. We've been in existence since 2013 or 12. 12. 12. 12. It was one of your first and, items of and business. We've done two services. Three. Two, two and a half. Two, oh, two and a half. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, you had three and eight. Two and a half. Because <laughs> we had waste. So I think you've done uh, one too. So it, it's, it's, it's not progressing as I had hoped. It really was the addition of two services, of which one is now no longer offered. So you're up, you're plus one. If plus you consider one. that waste was always on the always. table with these partners, yeah. you're, you're plus one. Yeah. Granted, operating at a much more efficient oh. and economical level, but. That may be the most frustrating part because the Joint Service Board has shown it's really effective. I mean, it's very efficient. Very productive, and but yet we just can't seem to move on to taking on other services as fast as I'd like. So oh, we will we'll continue we to push for that. Sorry, we, we can. Yeah. We can. Yes. Any question? Yeah. Questions being called. <laughs> All those in favor? Those opposed? Unanimously supported. <laughs> Let the record show. Um, <laughs> now Lunenburg County Cross Canada Tour purchase of advertising. Um, so Tina Henniger is a little bit more than halfway through her tour. It's been quite something to follow on on social media and on the regular media, um, CBC, <coughs> the national newspapers, um, radio. It's been quite uh, quite something, and I hope it translates into some people coming to Lunenburg County. And so with that, there is, um, there is kind of a, uh, an ad campaign planned for the return. And so there's a motion on the, on the, uh, in your package there for participating in that promotion. Yes, Your Worship, I move the Town Council of Town Bridgewater approve an unbudgeted expenditure for a business card ad as requested in document 17-014A by now Lunenburg County. By Deputy Tanner, and uh, yeah, that, this is for five hundred dollars. Yeah, that's what's going to add that yeah. to it. Let's, yes, five hundred dollars. Um, any discussion? No, no, they need the support. Yeah. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Uh, pilot transit system donation agreement. So we received the buses. Everyone saw one of the buses in the parade, which was fantastic. I did have someone ask if the balloons were staying on the bus. So they're, they're not, but <laughs> they them on the inside. Oh, but that, that was a legitimate question I received from an adult. Um, <laughs> living, breathing. 
Um, anyway, we do have to ratify the donation agreement with HRM, and so the motion is in your package. I move that Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater ratify the donation agreement between Halifax Regional Municipality and the Town of Bridgewater regard regarding the two buses as contained in document 16 051G. I have a seconder, please, Councilor McDonald. Um, we are going to have a launch party with these buses, and HRM Council will be invited um, so that we can publicly thank them and recognize uh, this donation because. This was huge. The bus was fantastic. Yeah, I'd just like to say kudos to you, Mayor Mitchell, for reaching out to Mayor Savage and HRM and their council and getting those two buses donated. It was a it was a great job. Thank you. It's a great partnership. Perhaps yeah, we should yeah. see if they would like to be One. part of the MJSB. Will we have balloons? <laughs> um, we'll have balloons. <laughs> yeah, we'll have balloons. <laughs> and cake. There will always well. be cake. All right. Any further discussion? No. All right. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Uh, our last item uh, before we go to an in-camera meeting is application for flying flag under policy 81 flag flying. Uh, applications for the pride flag to be flown down at Sheepbridge Landing July 19th, 29th, 2018. Someone care to make that motion? Councilor Thorburn. Yeah. I would move the town council of the town of Bridgewater approve the application for flying the pride flag as per policy 81 flag flying on the designated flagpole from July the 19th to the 29th. 2018. Shipyard second. Landing. Second uh, is by Deputy Mayor Tanner, and I want to thank Councilor Graves for representing Council at the Pride Flag raising this year. So yeah, thank you and, and no, speaking. And that was yeah. fantastic. Any discussion? Question. Question being called. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Uh, no other business. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Or we adjourn. So we have.